on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Sitting in the video village, at one point my husband, I looked over at my husband and we're both like teary because they're saying on the screen words from the book. You just can't imagine how that feels. It's, well, you probably can, but it's so much fun to see that. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, it's Friday. It is The Self-Publishing Show. Welcome along. It's me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Hello. Hello. <laughs> let us let us welcome our Patreon supporters before we do anything else, because it should be the first thing we do every week. We love people coming along, becoming a part of our family here and supporting the show and getting some goodies in return. Uh, so our patrons this week, we have uh, Kaylee Urbanayak and Benjamin Bruce and also Kit Ward. All good author names, I would say. Do you think they're real names? Why wouldn't they be? I'm sure they are, James. Is, your, is, is Blatch a real name? I don't know any other Blatches. Yeah, well, I, I don't think you'd make up the name Blatch, but Kirby Urbanayak, she'll be in touch. Might be he, but I think she uh, will be in touch, I'm sure, to let us know. But anyway, good. Welcome along. They've been to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. Okay, Mark, uh, we should say also straight away that as we speak, Ads for Authors is open for a short period of enrollment. First time in more than six months, I think, probably just over six months since we opened it last. And uh, that's been a long time, but uh, there you go, chance to get on board for 2021. Um, just quickly tell us what the course is and does. Well, it, I suppose the uh, the clue is in the name. So advertising for authors. Um, so it's uh, it's Facebook ads, um, Amazon ads, BookBub ads, and then lots of um, little bits and pieces that you'll need to know in order to make those platforms work. So things like ad design, blurbs, um, other bits and bobs. There's there's a lot of content. I mean, the, the, the Facebook course itself is, I think, probably over 30 hours long now. Um, the Amazon Ads course, which has been uh, tweaked and updated a bit, is is uh, presented, written and presented by Janet Margot, um, which uh, yeah, Janet worked at Amazon setting up the books um, uh, program. So that's, you know, there isn't really a course on the market from an Amazonian, that's for sure. Um, and because we like having um, people who know the platforms inside out doing the courses, uh, we've, we've got BookBub. Um, themselves doing the BookBub ads course, which um, is is going to be again, I think the best on the market when it comes to using BookBub ads. Not the um, not the email ads, but the the ads that appear at the bottom of the emails. Um, that that's uh, that's another exciting addition. And those three platforms together, those are pretty much at the moment the only ones you need to to know. And you probably only really need to know one or two of them um, to you know to get to get things moving. Um, but all all of those platforms are covered, and the intention is that it should be every everything you ever need to know about advertising will be in that course because yeah as as you know we we took the probably slightly foolish decision 4 years ago saying that everyone who uh, signed up has ever signed up gets all updates for free and we continue to add to the course and that might be going yeah. to bookbub and saying you know we need a we need to update our bookbub course because it's not good enough we want to make it better um, and then bookbub jump in and take care of that for us or you know taking the amazon course that i did originally um which I think may still be available. Um, I think we, we've, we've kept that course up. Mm. So you, you can look at how I do it, um, which is a little different from how Janet does it. But Janet is, you know, knows more about that platform than I do. So um, there's there's a lot of content, um, and you know, it's it's still a course that we're we're all really proud of. Yeah, I think it's a fair way of doing it. We we it's a big investment. Um, once you've got it, it's yours for life. Everything that gets added, you get as well. Um, and I just think it enables authors to make a good decision for the future. It's like an investment for their career that goes on for years rather than just a few weeks when they do that one course maybe that's live at the time. Certainly was the case, and um, we're more than happy for that to be the case. Uh, and now is a good time. It's you know it's been a it's been a ridiculously crazy twelve months or so coming well, up to twelve happened. months. Yeah, something did happen. It's now normal to be in the middle of a pandemic. We're right in the middle of it again in the UK. Figures looking worse than they ever have at any point. Hospitals close to being overwhelmed. Everyone's in their house, or should be uh, in their houses now. Um, 
And yet the other side of that is that digital industries, online retailers, organizations like Amazon, for instance, and Netflix and, and others have done very well during this period because there's been a change of I guess, of priorities, people being at home and wanting to read and watch films. It's been a great time for lots of authors who have done very well. Um, and so, and that's a dual thing. And it's a good point you made, actually, in one of your emails I was looking at this week, Mark, is that it's not just the fact that people are at home wanting to read books, but from an indie author point of view, a lot, millions of dollars have been taken out of the advertising market. So we are seeing cheap leads, cheap advertising, and it's, it's, it's been as cheap as it's been for a long time to reach readers. Yeah, so you've got any any store, and there's a, just a very large lorry just going past the window over there, so you might hear that. Apologies, listeners. Um, but, yeah, you've got big stores, like let's say Walmart isn't advertising so much at the moment. Um, I'm not sure that's the best example in the States, but Tesco's over here, any of the supermarkets, they're not really going to be pushing too much in the way of advertising because their stores are either not open or they're limited um, in, in what they're selling right now. W.A. Smith, as I think I mentioned last week, where my book is, um, no one can buy it at the moment because the store's shut. So there's not much point in advertising to sell those products because people aren't going into the stores. Now, Facebook and Amazon still have the same amount of ad inventory, the same eyeballs that they can uh, serve the ads to. Um, and because these all work on an auction basis, um, those big um, multinational ad budgets now being withdrawn um, because there's not much point in advertising means that they, the eyeballs that are available uh, are now cheaper to access than they were before just just, just through you know, lack of competition or less competition. So it, it is a good yeah. time. I, I'm definitely seeing um, Facebook especially is cheap at the moment. Um, so yeah. it is, it's a good time to be advertising. Well, think of the millions spent by the travel industry normally in advertising, yeah. including online advertising, live yep. events, anything like that. Anything just that you have can't to... do. Yeah, exactly. There's there's, yeah. there's a lot of industries that are not as fortunate as ours um, and are shuttered and have been for ages. There's not much, there's no, no point at all in those industries advertising for things they can't sell. So um, we don't so, have that yeah. problem because, because, you know, I could, you know, I was going to say I could download your book in you know with a couple of clicks. Obviously, I can't do that because you still haven't written it. Um, but I could download Lucy Scrolls' book, for example, and then have that on the yes. on the device within within a minute, um, and that's great for or us. You, you could download if you're watching on YouTube Barbara Hinsky's book, oh, Guiding very, Emily, with a very lo- nice, absolutely lovely front cover. That what is a segue. And the reason I. Yes, what a segue. Well done, the reason Alan. I've got this book <laughs> is because uh, Barbara is our interviewee today. So we're going to move on to hearing from Barbara. So yeah, this is her latest book, Guiding Emily. I bought it for my wife because we brought up a guide dog uh, puppy in the house. And that's uh, the centre of this story. And your story. daughter's called so, Emily. And my daughter's called Emily, who does require <laughs> guiding. Um, and uh, yes, this is partly, I think, a sort of charitable effort from Barbara as well, because she's involved in the uh, organisations in the States, provide dogs. Um, Barbara is a former attorney. I'm trying to think what else. It's a while, actually, since we recorded this interview, but it was very, very enjoyable. She does very well. She has a knack of getting the business side of things right. And it's all very well being a good writer, um, that is important. Of course it is. But you do have to be a business person to one degree or another. You need to run an organization, even if it's just you and your books. Um, and Barbara is, I think, perhaps because in America, being an attorney might not be quite the same as being a lawyer in the UK. It's quite a business, an aggressive business there. So they're quite a lot of business acumen as well as the legal side of things. And I think Barbara's brought that into her uh, career. So including when she heard a friend of a friend might be connected with Hallmark, having a conversation that led on to something really amazing, which you're going to hear about in this interview. So without further ado, let us hear from Barbara Hinsky. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Bob. Oh, Barbara Hinsk. Hinsky, oh, I've got to, I failed at the first yeah. attempt. Barbara Hinsky is your author name, but I'm going to call you Bob because that's how I think people call you, Bob. Yes. Welcome to the self-publishing show, Bob. Thank you. It's it's quite an honor and a thrill to be here. Hey, well, we're excited to have you here. Um, I think we're going to get into some details in the interview, but I know that you were one of our early course participants and uh and we've been delighted to see your success so we're going to talk about the rosemont series we're going to talk about you i think you, let's start at the beginning before okay. you were writing i think you were a lawyer yes like mark i was a lawyer um you know slaving away in the trenches and doing a lot of writing but contracts i was in 
the business side of law. So you were writing so, contracts rather than romances. Yes, exactly. Okay. Nothing not, creative about it, really. Not quite the same thing. And yeah. writing for you was something that was just in the back of your mind or you'd had a dabble in the past at some point? You know, I hadn't had a dabble and I didn't even think that I could write. Um, my undergraduate degree was actually in engineering. I was an industrial engineer, so I had a technical side to me. And when I started practicing law, the partners said, oh, my goodness, this this woman can't write. We need to get her tutored. And before somebody really looked at how much they were spending, I had spent two years in learning, being privately tutored by the dean of the local law school. So I learned how to become a very good technical writer. And then I thought, OK, well, maybe I can write. Um, and then my dad retired and sat at home and wrote murder mysteries, wrote whodunits for his into for 17 years until he passed away. He never tried to publish them, never sent them to an agent. Wow. Um, but he was kind of an inspiration. And when he died, I read those manuscripts and it just sort of sparked something in me. I thought, well, you know, I, I, I have a voice. I'd like to do this. Did you ever do anything with your father's manuscripts? No, I always thought when I retired that I would. And in fact, just this weekend, I dug them out again. And it was like a wonderful visit with my dad. I'll tell mm. you, it was wonderful. I spent a lot of time in, in tears. Mm. But I, I don't think that was, he died in 2000. And fiction is different Yeah. now. And I, I don't think I can turn them around. And I don't think I want to. They're what they need to be. And I have now my own significant voice and like a lot of us on this podcast i have far more ideas than i have time to put them into paper so yeah that's where i'm settled so inspired by your father and after he passed away i can see that that motivation it's a strong motivation as well so where were you working you were still working as a lawyer at this point when you thought you might give yeah. it a go yeah i was still working at a lawyer in um, I started writing in 2011, early in two, late in 2010, I broke my neck in a car accident hmm. and I was in one of those horrid neck braces and I had double vision for months. Um, still have a little bit of it at times, but my lower body was absolutely untouched. So I had tons of energy. I was in no pain, but I couldn't watch TV and I couldn't read with double vision really. Um, so I just started walking and I would walk in this little road around my house for like three hours at a time. And I just came up with this five book Rosemont series in my head. Um, and then I started writing it. Um, I published my first Rosemont coming to Rosemont, the first one in the series in December of 2012 under my maiden name, which was a pen name, so that if my writing was horrible, I wouldn't embarrass myself in the <laughs> lawyer community. Um, and just tell us about the Rosemont series. So tell us what the setting was and what these stories were. Yeah. Are. So the Rosemont series, Rosemont is a stately manor home in the Midwest, and it is a supersized version of my own historic home, which kind of inspired some of the scenes, but my own home doesn't have six fireplaces and, you know, all that. Um, so it's, it's a story about um, a 55-year-old woman forensic accountant who loses her husband suddenly to a heart attack. That's bad. Um, finds out after he, was, after he passed that he was embezzling from the college where he worked. Okay, that's worse. And then finds out he had a second family. Okay, that's all really bad. But um, he had inherited this stately manor home known as Rosemont and had never told her about it. Okay, well, so now he's gone, it's hers. That's not so bad. She goes to see it. Basically, she's just gonna put it on the market and sell it, but she's so curious about if she'll get some answers as closure on who this guy was that she'd been married to for many years and didn't know, and walks into Rosemont, the door shuts behind her, and she says, I am home, I'm gonna stay here. That door shuts behind her, um, scene is actually inspired on in my own life because my husband and I um, bought this house. We got married in 2010 in this house. 
And when the door shut behind us, we're like, okay, we hadn't even walked through the house. And you, we're like, we're buying this house. Just, yeah, we're yeah, which it. does happen. Just knew. Yeah. Yeah, it does happen. Um, and despite the fact that friends and family said, are you out of your minds? But we weren't, and we did. And that's Maggie's experience. And then it, so a dog adopts her on her first night in Rosemont, like dogs do. And that leads her to the local veterinarian, who is their love interest. The town has a lot of fraud and political corruption, which was based upon a lot of research I did in middle-sized cities in the United States. This has been a problem. There's lots of corruption and embezzlement. I built in that kind of theme because she's a forensic accountant. She gets involved in that, and then the series goes. I was originally going to cap it off at five books, and the last one, Bringing Them Home, was just my little tie-it-all-up love story. And then I kept getting so many lovely emails from readers that we want more. Um, and my author assistant, who is wonderful, said to me, Barb, what is the matter with you? People want to read more of these books. Why don't you write another book? I'm like, all right, well. Um, so I've written um, two more now. The last, the second, the seventh book, uh, Restoring What Was Lost, will be published in October. And so I've kind of taken her plot arc on in new directions because I really didn't want this to be stale and for people to think, oh my God, you know, you really need, you've gone way beyond what you should have. How would you describe them genre wise? It sounds like a bit of romance, a bit of women's fiction, would you say? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Squirrely women's fiction, there, there is romance in them there's mystery thriller suspense and i've written some other mystery thriller suspenses recently and i i do well with that they're probably lighter on the romance if somebody is really a romance reader they may be disappointed because it's not heavily into okay. that and not into those tropes it's not firmly genre romance but women's fiction it fits right beautifully I a uh, lot of that I cross too many genres, but okay. I ignore that and, well, and soldier forth. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I'm just having a quick look on Amazon and uh, I can see that, you know, the first in the series, as you say, um, coming to Rosemont, which is 2013, is currently in the top 2,500 in the paid Kindle store. It's 65 in women's crime fiction, 38 in women's sagas. I mean, this is a book that's still selling very well. Um, so we're going to, a little yes. spoiler alert, this has been hugely successful for you, which we're very excited about. So, yeah. so how did that bit happen? How did writing the book turn into something that's clearly been a very good commercially successful career for you? Well, yes, I think the largest single factor in it being successful has been paying attention to Mark's courses, being a student. I watch every one of them at least once. I take notes and I apply. Now I have some, now I'm big enough that I have somebody who does my ads and watches all that for me. But I know how to do it. So thanks to you guys, I know how to track the metrics. If I had to take it back on, I could. So it makes me competent to supervise it. And I think as much as many writers don't want to, if you're going to be self-published and want to make money, then that's part of the deal. Yeah, I think um, it's just worth pausing on that moment because it's very important. I'm doing this now with our imprint. You've got to be competent yourself before you outsource to somebody else. Otherwise, you can't manage them. You can't manage the project and the program if you're just hoping, fingers crossed, that they know what they're yes. doing. Um, yes. So you, you learn to inside out first. And you've got to the point now where you're comfortable with somebody else. Yes. And I think she does it. They do it better than I do. Uh, case in point, and I want to talk about my book bub ads and some, something I did recently at the advice of Mark Dawson, which is why it's doing so well. Um, but when I hired this company, one of the terms that they use in their Amazon ads was something, I'll get to it. I'll leave, leave that as a spoiler, but was something I thought, this is crazy. This is absolutely nuts. Are you out of your mind? And so I was just what? all over them. And then, you know, we looked and dug into the results. Crazy. One of my most profitable terms, I don't think you'd guess it, is cat litter. Wow. Yeah. That People is who, crazy. 
Isn't that crazy? Would you ever in a million years think to try cat litter? No. Nah. I mean, there's, but, do there's dogs on your covers, and you say dogs feature yeah. fairly heavily in the books. But that's random, oh. random. Isn't that random? So that was but a search term that came up from, uh, you know, you can look at search terms people have used to find you. Was that how that yeah. came up? I assume so. I think they use uh, KDP and uh, Kalytics. They use a yeah, whole yeah. bunch of those. And that was one of the terms. And lo and behold, uh, people searching for cat litter like to buy my books. So God love them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's good to leave your mind open a little bit to someone else's expertise. Yes. One of the things that early on helped me, uh, there were a couple things that launched my success. One was in July 4th, 2014. I believe it was 2014. I was, yeah, I was lucky enough to qualify for a book bub ad for coming to Rosemont. And I remember thinking, oh, it's so expensive. This is crazy. What am I doing? And I thought, oh, well, what the heck, do it. And I did. And, you know, I just kind of went about my day and I'm running around doing stuff. And then in the evening, I checked to see how I'm doing. I'm number one in the entire Kindle store. Wow. I was, you know, the book bub, my book was the first one that they put on there. I sold 10,000 books. <gasps> well, that's a life changer. Then I became one of the book bub best bestsellers. And when they do a blog on women's sagas, a couple of times my book, my series has been first. You just can't negate that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then, of course, book bub would have none of me. For years and years, even though I asked most politely, they, you know, refuse me because I'm on KDP Select. Yeah. And I think they really want you to be wide. I'm not going wide. But on August 9th, lightning hit again. And I did coming to Rosemont for free, which I've never done. I've never wanted to do. I hate people getting stuff for free. Well, but I listen to your stuff. I've got a series. And... Starting that day, I mean, not only did I sell, actually sell, I don't know how that's possible. I sold 150 ebooks of coming to Rosemont on the day it was free. I had 60,000 downloads. Mm -hmm. and Yeah. And my reviews increased. And I've been selling about, for the rest of the series, I'll total about 150 copies a day since then. I realize in, in your terms, in your world, that's small. In my world, that's big. Yeah. That's huge. Um, well, that's huge. Yeah. And did you then see, were you in KDP Select at that point? Yes. Yeah. So did you then see um, page reads going up oh, in the yeah. weeks that followed yeah. with those 60,000 yeah. downloads? Yeah. And interestingly, my uh, since I've been using this new marketing team, my print sales have gone up. I've tracked my percentage, percentage of sales for years. It's been about 85% ebook, 15% Fit, um, print with 29% between 29 and 30 every single solitary month from, from KU, my income. So that's kind of how my numbers have worked out. Um, so I, I don't know as I would ever go wide. No. Um, so you had a book, bar, which was a big Philip for you uh, in yeah. those early days. And then you started putting into practice what, uh, so, in, so in terms of the book writing, you had, you had, coming to Rosemont, and then how quickly did you follow that up? Um, I believe the next year I did the next one, and I, I pumped out for the next five years. I did one a year while okay. I was still working full time. Okay. When I thought I finished the series, then I did a couple of murder mysteries, and I did my recent book, but then I went back, and I've written now two more of the Rosemont series. Okay. Oh, and I did my Christmas novella in there too. Right. And your um, uh, book bub obviously was, was, as I say, a big fill-up. Uh, then was it Facebook ads you were running in those early days? Yes. Oh, yeah. Facebook ads. And I was killing it with thanks to Mark. I learned how to do it. And I was killing it with Facebook ads until a couple of And I restarted them now because Amazon doesn't like just their own ads which is enough to make you insane with these people. But anyway, I, for a while, for a couple of years, I just discontinued all Facebook ads because it didn't seem like they were working. But I, I knew that my base would be Facebook users. 
And so I had my author page and to grow it, I followed the strategy from another company that said, set, set up a fan page, an independent fan page that you can draw eyes to people who would be interested in your books. And then you can promote your books on that page and draw them over to your author page. So at that time, Downton Abbey was in its second season. And instead of, you know, they were advising me to, well, I love fiction. I love books. I'm like, no, 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 too generic. Downton Abbey fans. So I started the Downton Abbey fans page. One of the best business decisions I've ever made. It's now like 150,000 likes. I get offers to buy it. I would never sell it because it's now it's easy. I've got so much content. We just roll it along. Um, and it also has provided, it, it certainly has grown my author page to almost 40,000 likes. And um, I've got a private group I run of about 3,000 that's very active, sort of a street team. Other opportunities came to me, Cult Box UK, which was an online um, entertainment sort of source, contacted me because their Downton Abbey reviewer was in a car accident. This is on a Tuesday. They need a review for Thursday. Right. Can they send me a link and can I become their new reviewer? I got a full-time job. I say, of course I can, because that's what the hours between midnight and 3 a.m. are yes, for, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you're just exactly. wasting those on your sleep. Exactly. So I did that. What fun that was. Um, I did that for the whole series. I did Home Fires. I did The House Inn. I did The Crown. Um, that's that website has been sold and I don't do that anymore, but and how do you, with this, how many opportunities came this tangent Downton Abbey page? How do yeah. you then use that to get people to buy your book, to put it crudely? Yeah. So when I have a new release, I just post it on the Downton Abbey page, um, fans page. I don't know how many book sales I get from that but I certainly grew my author page and I get sales off of that. Yeah. And it's just fun. Certainly the, the exercise of writing reviews every week honed my skills as a writer, like probably no other experience would have been gave me some credibility. And now like when they come out with a new Downton Abbey cookbook, which they do all the time, they have official cookbooks. Yes. People send it to me. And I get the free cookbook and I cook out of it and I post on it. And so it's been kind of a fun thing that now doesn't take much. I think it was more of a platform builder than a sailor, than, a, than something that sold books. But I could see you've obviously got um, some business now there, Barb, in terms of uh, thinking a little bit out, outside of the, the regular, starting things that yeah. are vaguely related, but not directly about sales, which I think some people struggle with that connection. They think they're sort of wasting their time if they're not directly selling their book, but it's worked incredibly well for you simply to build up a base yes. of, of, of people who potentially are your market. Yes, absolutely. Is that, yeah, so, that, I mean, you're a lawyer rather than a, uh, you know, selling services, or I suppose yes. lawyers do sell services in a way, but I think you were in-house, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, I was in-house. Um, and so maybe that gave me a little more business okay. savvy, savvy. And I think certainly the business aspect of being an independent author is a big part of it if you want to make money. Yeah. And that stuff's all in my wheelhouse. So that part is a little easier for me. And what about... Um, the technical aspects of running Facebook ads, running Amazon ads, setting up your Facebook page. Did you have much experience in that, that area? No, I had no experience. I had to learn it all. Um, and there were a lot of mornings in my bathrobe at my kitchen counter, you know, either sw combination of swearing mm -hmm. and crying um, cause it wasn't easy for me. And I, and I do have visual impairments. So that is, is difficult too, but um, one of my superpowers is I'm tenacious, and other people would say I'm stubborn. Um, so I just kept going. Did you spend and lose a lot of money in those early days? How long did it take you to start seeing? Oh, yeah, yeah, profits? I think I did. Um, 
you know, I, I hired some people that didn't work out. So that's expensive. But I always kept my eyes on my ads and my ads turned out nothing was really a total, very few were a total disaster. Um, So I was lucky with my graphics early on. I had, I have sliders on my website, barbarahinsky.com at the top that show my book on a table, pretty background, cup of coffee. They're beautiful. I think I've used them in my ads. They've been wonderful back in the day. Probably they'd be a little stale now, but. So. I can see behind you the Guiding Emily book. Uh, so you've moved yes. on. Have you finished Rosemont or will there possibly be more? No. Yeah, there's one coming out in October. And now our heroine is in a different job. I don't want to do spoilers, but yeah, there'll, there'll be more of that. And that's just such a gentle, happy place. It'll be interesting to see. I wrote the seventh book this this winter, summer, when I was myself craving comfort and community and connection. Mm. And I think that's reflected in the book. So I'll be anxious to see um, what my readers think. So tell us about Emily Main and this new yeah. series. Uh, this book has my heart and I'm going to actually reach over, reach up and show it close. So if you're watching on YouTube, this is a beautiful Labrador, I'm going to say. Yeah. This is uh, a black lab. His name in the book is is Garth. Uh, and Guiding Emily is the uh, love story between Garth, the guide dog, and Emily Maine, his handler, who loses her eyesight on her honeymoon, and it's their journey together. This book, um, this book could have been written for my wife, word for word for oh, my wife. Really? We've just brought up a guide dog puppy. And uh, unfortunately, oh, we won't do it again because it broke our hearts to say goodbye to her, which, of course, is what you have to do. We had her for, do. for a, a nearly two years and she's now in advanced training. She's the most gorgeous. Yes. So it broke our hearts uh, to lose Charlotte. But uh, I tell you what, uh, I will be buying this book uh, immediately after this interview because uh, oh, my wife will adore it, I'm sure. Good. It's The reviews have been stunning. And within the... Guy dog and the blind community. Um, I have been overwhelmed with the reception. Just just on the reviews, I did notice that yeah. uh, 184 reviews on the dot com site, 90 percent five star. You don't see that very often. That's uh, 4.9 out of five. That's uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, you obviously. I'm, I uh, love this book. It's the first in the series. Um, and if I can just. Uh, Talk a little bit about, can I say how it came about? Yes, of course. How I, Go ahead. Yeah. So in uh, February of 2019, I was at a library gala and naming rights for a character in my next book were one of the live auction items. Emily Maine is the one who bought those rights, incidentally. And I was seated next to the development director for the Foundation for Blind Children in Phoenix, Arizona. The foundation is within is like a mile and a half from my house, and we're talking. And he said, you've never been in here? Like, no. Well, you and your husband come and take a tour next week. So we did. And I was so incredibly moved seeing what they do, their classrooms. Um, they service children from zero to 105. So they have a large adult population. And this little four-year-old boy throws his arms around me. And he's just giggling like crazy. And the director said, you know, he was born deaf and blind in Canada. And his parents were told he would never walk, would never talk, and probably wouldn't live very long, just keep him comfortable. Well, his heartbroken parents refused to accept that. And they emigrated to the U.S. and enrolled him at the foundation. And there he was in my arms, walking and talking and living a bright future. So, of course, by then I'm Mm -hmm. full on. Like, I've lost it. I'm crying. And I said to Steve, what do you need? What can I do to help? And he said, we need to raise awareness within the sighted community of the isolation that the visually impaired and blind feel. And we're a nonprofit. We need money. Well, I said, good. You know, I'm not a trust fund baby. I can't write you a check. But I'm an author. A book can do both of those things. So I'm dedicating half of, I'm donating half of my proceeds from Guiding Emily to the foundation 
And they were wonderfully supportive in my research. Um, they gave me white cane training. I got wow. to take that. What did you actually because, blindfold yourself and, and walk with the dog? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. They put you in um, goggles and mine had a little pinprick of vision in the center. So I could actually see, but I'm telling you what, when we went outside with the white cane, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever had a panic attack before, but I did then. Hmm. It was terrifying. So that was helpful to have. I was able to network my way into guide dogs for the blind in California and spent three days behind the scenes um, seeing things what people like you do. And so I, am, I did not want to victimize the visually impaired. I wanted to honorably portray their journey. Um, there are a lot of fictional blind people, and they're not always very admirable. Um, alcoholics and promiscuous and mm -hmm. drug dealers. And, you know, this community wanted somebody that is living life like we all do with courage and not limited by their blindness. So in order to, you know, Emily loses her sight on her honeymoon, there's obviously this big period of devastation and depression this book would have been very heavy and depressing if I didn't intersperse it with chapters written from Garth's perspective. And he is funny and he is light and lovely. And I think elevates the book. Um, so I, obviously this book is really close to my heart. Yes, I can, I can tell that. Labradors are the best. So that's, uh, we, have oh, yeah. a, we have a pet Labrador as well. A Goldie though, not, uh, not black, but he looks a very, very handsome boy. Okay, so if you're watching on YouTube, we'll go onto Amazon and check out Guiding Emily. That's a gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous cover, by the way. How, uh, how did that come yeah. about? You know, everything about this has been fairly easy. I, so think of that, February 2019, I get the idea. I'm still working full time. I retired from the practice of law in July, spent a week on set on my, on the movie that my novella was made into, and then started writing guiding ammo. And plus I had to do all this research, white cane training, go to guide dogs for the blind, all this, everything fell in place. So I started thinking about the cover and I thought I really want the, a dog's face on the cover. Um, the black lab came from a, friend's guide dog. His name is Miyoki. So that's what it's based upon. And I wanted to ask you, so what the puppy you trained, was it a lab as well? It was a, la a cross between a Labrador and a Golden Retriever. Ah, oh, they're uh, just which, fabulous. Which they do, and they breed their own dogs, and they have quite a few labs, quite a few Retrievers, and quite a few crosses, and a few um, German Shepherds as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah. she was absolutely gorgeous. She had a lot of that uh, Retriever kindliness, that sort of generous oh, character gosh. but quite a lot of nouse yeah. as well which you get with a labrador uh, well they're very yeah. food orientated so they yes they do things for yeah. food yeah uh, and that's yeah. why he has garth has an affiliation or an affinity for crunchy cheetos in the book yes um, of course so i just literally this cover took half an hour wow i didn't design it but i looked on shutterstock for pictures on the second page was this picture. I said, okay, I think I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> there and you are. Well, it looks gorgeous. It it's quite striking as well. Um, well, look, best of luck with that book, uh, particularly as the proceeds are, are going to such a worthy cause. Uh, we're, in, um, we're in that position now where we're sort of, we want Charlotte to do well and to pass and, and, and become yes. qualified. But if she doesn't, there's a possibility she comes back to live with us. So right. the children are crossing their fingers. She's going to fail because we want her to pass. That's the whole point of doing but what, it. You know, you what go. a wonderful thing, as you well know, when I was at, the, at, at a graduation ceremony at Guide Dogs for the Blind, there was a man, I would say in his 50s, he was an executive at, I think, Apple. So he had a big job and, you know, he presented himself as, as somebody who had a big job. And it was so touching. He said he couldn't wait to go to work on Monday because now he said, maybe with the dog, I'll make some more friends at work. Wow. Oh, oh that's heartbreaking, and, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it is heartbreaking. And so the difference so many, these dogs make to people's lives is, is incredible. Yeah. You have to see it to believe it really do. Um, yeah. That's you, a beautiful thing you did. Yeah, thank you. Well, my wife did it mainly, but we uh, broke all our hearts. Um, yeah. Barbara, now you mentioned in passing 
that uh, one of your books has been adapted into a film, into a Hallmark film, yes. which has been out. Yes. Uh, so just tell us how that happened. So um, I wrote The Christmas Club, I want to say 2016, um, based upon a loose homily from a sermon I had heard in church 30 years ago with the point being doing kind things, but do them in a nice way. Um, woman, I set this in 1952 in Cleveland. Um, and woman comes out of the bank, her purse falls and, and opens and her Christmas club money flies out six, $5 bills, Christmas clubs at the time, if you don't have them where you are, where you'd go in and put money down in an account all year long. And then at Christmas, you'd take the money out with your interest and they'd usually give you a toast or a little gift, something like that. So her Christmas club money flies to the wind. A gentleman sees her fall, helps her up, helps her back into the bank and a woman they help her in the bank. And he says, well, what did you lose? You know, six, $5 bills. She'd worked all year for that. And he says, well, I'll go see if I can find it. Of course, the money's gone. He goes out, opens his wallet. He has five fives. And he said, all right, well, I'll tell her I found five fives. And the woman follows him out. She has one five. They pull their money and give it to the old lady so that she feels like you've done me a kindness, but you haven't treated me like a charity case. And then the $5, each of the $5 bills gets found by somebody who does something kind with it. So it's got a very kind heart, this little, little book, 20,000 words. And from the get go, people said, this would be great on Hallmark. And I thought, you know, I think it would be, I didn't know anybody at Hallmark, but I just started asking every single person who I came in contact with, do you know anybody at the Hallmark channel? And finally, somebody said, well, my neighbor at the cabin produces Goodwitch, which is their most successful franchise. Do you want me to give him a copy? I'm like, well, yeah, put the phone down and run a copy next door right now. Of course, I want you to give him a copy. And from there, it went. It just went. He loved it. He was going to acquire it and took it to Hallmark. And they decided that they wanted to acquire it, which they do when they evidently if they think it's got the possibility of a series or a sequel. So they required the, the rights. That was nice for me because Hallmark paid double what I was going to get from him. So there it is. And um, it filmed last summer in Winnipeg and was on the Hallmark channel this, this November and December. I, um, well, and well was, the November, December I, just gone. It's, it's, yeah. it's debuted. I mean, um, yeah. And yeah. I know you don't necessarily become a millionaire from these deals, particularly no, gosh, with, no. with a high con high um, turnover of production that Hallmark have to have. But right. you would say this has been a venture very worthwhile for you. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. You don't get rich. I mean, so many people think, oh my gosh, now you can, you know, no, you don't. Has it built my platform? Absolutely. Was it fun? Yes. Is it so much fun to look at the TV and see on the screen based on the book by Barbara Hinsky? I've got a framed still shot of that. Wow. I held a big party at my house. We hauled all the furniture out of the first floor and had a big viewing party to celebrate it. That was fun. So in addition to all the bragging rights and fun and you know stuff that you can put on things, I also treated it as a business opportunity. Um, the Hallmark Channel gets a ton of publicity for their countdown to Christmas. So my assistant and I, she's a great researcher, we contacted every single solitary publication that published the, the, the movie schedule and asked if they wanted to interview me. 95% of them did. I spent a month practically hardly getting out of my pajamas and no time for a shower practically, because I did hundreds of interviews. I was interviewed in Reader's Digest and Good Housekeeping Magazine, um, all of that. And I would always mention Guiding Emily, and they'd say, get back to me when you publish that. And I did. I was on the local television twice. I've been on the television with Guiding Emily. And so I used that to parlay um, this next book. And when I was in Winnipeg, um, for filming, I went for a week of filming. 
I thought maybe, you know, my husband went with me and I thought, okay, you know, he's probably going to be bored. So maybe we'll go a couple of days. We went every day. It was so much fun. They treated us so well. But I went with probably five rehearsed pitches in case I had an opportunity to pitch them to anybody. I, I, nice. wrote them out, I said them in the mirror and I memorized them because I don't know, I was, I'm very good off the cuff on that. You know, I was a little starstruck with all of that. And don't you know, I had an opportunity to pitch every single solitary thing and they all landed well. In fact, I went back and didn't, did another couple pitches because I thought, well, I'm out of ammo. Let's <laughs> see what I can do. So I guess I don't think this comes naturally to most authors and it didn't to me. I, I work with a, a life coach who's a business coach right. and he said, Barb, what do you got prepared to pitch? And I'm like, well, nothing really. I don't know. And he said, well, that's ridiculous. Um, I think you're right. I think some authors will be listening to this thinking it's just not them because they're introverts by nature. Um, but there's a way of of treating it in a business sense, rehearsing. And if you've got yes. something to say to somebody because you've thought about this opportunity, that's a little bit different from having to make polite conversation, which is actually what fills most of us with horror in that in yes. environment. So you, you, you had a purpose to your travels to Winnipeg to, to yes, visit a location. Absolutely. And I didn't have to like shoulder my way in with these pitches. The first time I met our executive producer, John Eskinas, I'm shaking his hand in the little bake shop scene. By the way, we got, my husband and I hey, got, got cameos. In. Super yeah. Hitchcock-like. Yeah, which is fun. Yeah, so that was fun. But he said to me, he said, so what else have you got for me? We need to work together yeah. again. So you didn't even have to no. ask him. No, it's a good thing I was prepared, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of just going, oh, oh wow. Well. Have those yeah. elevator moments ready. Um, yes. What, what fun uh, and how brilliant to, yeah. to have uh, have that made for you, uh, or have that film made. And, and in terms of the yeah. film itself, uh, how much did it change from your book? How much was 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 your dialogue? And, and, and were you happy with the way that the screenwriters had adapted it? I was thrilled with the screenplay. It was just lovely. And there were some things I wish I had thought of, but it's completely different. It's set current day and it's Hallmark. It's, they focus on a love story, whereas my book didn't focus so much on the love story, but on the kind of pay it forward, random acts of kindness thing. Right. They were both wonderful. Honestly, I think the book is a little more profound, um, but it was, it was wonderful. I think they did a great job. I was proud of it. Sitting in the video village with, Everybody you've got a headphone on and they're treating you like a big deal. It's really crazy. And at one point, my husband, I looked over at my husband and we're both like teary mm. because they're saying on the screen words from you, the book. You wrote, yeah. You just can't, um, you just can't imagine how that feels. It's, well, you probably can, but it's so much fun to see that. Superb. And in terms of your yeah. career, Barbara, can you give us, uh, an idea of you don't have to give us precise figures but what sort of yeah. difference this has made to your life oh well certainly it's made a difference a couple of things the connection to readers has been so satisfying so much more satisfying and and I had a great legal career and I'm proud of it and I love the people I worked with and I love the work I did and I still do some some things on a consultant basis um but this is so much different. My brand is encouraging, comforting, uplifting fiction. And so to get that response from my reader group is, is just everything. So there's that aspect of it. I, I'm making a difference in people's lives, which is what I wanted to do. In terms of Money as, you know, it's so interesting. I'm sure everybody can relate. You go to a wedding reception or something, family gathering, or it's like, oh, well, you're doing what you love. And mm. you, you just get patronized all over the place. Uh, Mark's big enough. He doesn't get that anymore, but I'm sure he did in the beginning. And okay, well, yeah, I am doing what I love, but it's also, make no mistake, it's hard work. This is a lot of hard work, even when you love doing it there's a lot of commitment. And so I've sold in my series well over a hundred thousand books. And instead of the 17 cents a book, I'm getting, 
you know, three plus bucks a book um, for a hobby. That, that's yeah. like real money, huh? That is proper real money. That's uh, that's that's, all, that's real. That's lawyer money, Bob. Yeah, that's lawyer money. It's yeah. good money. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and you know, I I want to encourage people just to do what I did. Ask people with guiding Emily. I've decided that I think Emma Stone would be perfect as the actress for Emily. So I, Emma Stone is, is from Phoenix. I started asking around, does anybody know Emma Stone's mother? I, I picked her mother because Elizabeth Mitchell was the actress in The Christmas Club. It was her first Hallmark book, Hallmark movie. And she's known for Lost and she kind of plays a badass character. So this was different. And she said, well, her mother read The Christmas Club and called her up and said, Elizabeth, have your agent find out if somebody's bought the screen rights. And if they have, I want you to get a part in that. So some mothers have um, influence. So I started asking around everybody, does anybody know Emma Stone's mother? Okay, I finally get a yes. And I find out who her production company is. I've been in contact with them and they are present as we speak, they're presenting it to Emma. Wow. She may not do it, but if I hadn't been out there at the grocery store, at Costco, at the pharmacy, yeah, wherever, Costco. yapping about, does anybody know? You'd be surprised. So don't hesitate to ask people. People like yeah. to help you, particularly if they have a connection they can make. And no one's going to help you if you don't ask. Yes. So this yeah, is the this is, is always no. not so much about taking opportunities, which is one thing. This is about creating opportunities. I think well, the message from you I is go out yeah, there and create them both. and leverage once yeah. it happens, make sure that you yes. make the most of it, but it's actually yeah. making those things happen for you rather than waiting for them to happen for you, happen to you. Yeah. But um, yeah, don't be afraid to do things and everything isn't successful for me. I decided with my Hallmark movie, I would take out a banner ad. No other authors had done that on the um, web page that the Hallmark channel had for their movie. So that was $5,000. Wow. That's a lot of money. But they designed the ad for me. They were so nice to me. And I thought, well, what greater congruence than the book to the movie? Yeah. What I didn't realize was that all the good ad time was taken up by Campbell Soup because they had a sponsor. Green bean cas yeah. okay. casserole was sponsored placement. Okay. okay. Well, I don't think I sold one single book. That right. was five grand. Uh, that's a hard lesson. Yeah. Um, so I don't always get it right for sure. But you took the chance and uh, yes. But I take chances. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Barbara, it's quite inspiring listening to you. And I've actually bought the paperback version here in the UK. So that'll be there'll be an Amazon printer whirring somewhere now, printing that off for the next couple of days. Yeah, and my wife uh, will read it and I'll read it after her. Um, I want to say congratulations on your career. I know that you, you've credited thank Mark you. and his teaching. So we should say oh, thank yeah. you to Mark, me as well, because I'm learning from him uh, all the time as well. And I know it's made a... Well, you said yourself, it's made a significant difference to um, uh, yes. to you, which is wonderful. But we're, you know, in the same way that you do things for your readers, we're absolutely thrilled, thrilled when people come to us and say thank yeah. you because it's made a difference to me. So, so great and bigger and better things. I can't wait to see the uh, Guiding Emily movie with Emma Stone. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm yeah. hoping Who someone knows, else. Bro. It's also being considered by another big. Yeah, I was going to say, so. and if Emma doesn't doesn't do it for whatever reason who knows where that's going to lead that process that you've started yeah. in, in these scripts sometimes scripts do you do hear some big films they were knocking around the scripts under various people for 15 years before yeah. somebody said let's let's do this now um yeah. so yeah who knows brilliant bob thank you so much indeed for joining us thank you for having me one of these years i'm going to get to one of your events and if, if you see this crazy, crazy lady coming at you with her arms wide, just don't. <laughs> I'm going to be hugging I can't wait. We'll be both in, of you. Well, we're going to hug. Way. We're going to hug it up when we meet each other. And uh, next time Thank we're in you. Phoenix, we have been to Phoenix actually on our travels. I hadn't realised you were basically. We have. Yeah, we went there last year, I think. Uh, John and I did an interview very nearby. Um, oh my gosh. Actually in Phoenix, yeah. So um, okay, well we'll get together next then. time. Yeah, next time we will make sure that we thank come you. and see you. Super, For sure, Bob. Thank you so much yeah. indeed. Thank you. It was a thrill. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. 
There you go. We talk a lot, don't we, Mark? People who have books optioned and discussions go on, and I know there's been interest in your books and they're bubbling away in the background. It's not that often we speak to an author who's had their film made, and Barbara's been on the set of a film, listening to actors saying the words that she wrote, or after they've been through several drafts, no doubt, uh, for the screenplay, uh, which must be quite an quite a exciting time. Yeah, absolutely. It would be. Yeah, that's one thing I would certainly um, down tools to you know jump on a plane to wherever something was being shot to see um, a film being made. That would be great. So that is a, a certainly one of the uh, one of the things that I think authors most would like to see happen is, is seeing yeah. uh, a book make it to TV or film. Might have some news on that now, soon, but we'll have. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> now. I- you probably can't answer this for contractual reasons, but I was thinking that it would be sensible for an author, any author, trad or indie, to get their film, get the first film made. I wouldn't worry personally. People worry, oh, how much should I be? You know, what's a fair amount for this? And how can I make sure I'm not going to be ripped off? And I think surely the benefits of having your name attached to a film outweigh whether you get $10,000 or $40,000 in that first, first payment. You'd almost almost do it for free, allow them to make that book into a film um, because of the potential long-term benefits of being discovered as an author? Mm, that's a little bit naive. Um, yes, I, mm. I, I know generally, I know what you're getting at. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. I mean, I, I can't I can't talk about numbers. I, I have just signed a deal um, in December. Maybe we'll do a podcast about it later on. But my view on that is... Although in principle, yeah, give, you know, giving the rights away for twelve months as you know as a free option, you know, I can see why you might want to do that. But my my counter to that is, I like my partners to have skin in the game. Um, so mm. in in the same way that when I was traditionally published, I, I was you know always pushing for a slightly larger advance, even though an advance is just technically an, an advance on royalties. It's just kind of money up front. Um, and and there are consequences if you don't earn that back, as I didn't um, the first two books. I think for something like this, for the film, I, I you know want them to feel that they have invested fairly heavily in the IP, and then that's something that I think would serve as good motivation to actually get something made, so they can make that money back again. Um, yes. So yeah, you, I know what and you mean, do, and, they, and there is there is a benefit. Yeah. I'm not greedy on those on those scores because there's definitely a benefit, a significant one to yeah. having. Uh, a film out there that based on books you'll sell more books um yeah but and i'm definitely not in favor by the way of this this culture of organizations saying oh can you design this poster for our restaurant and uh, we'll mm. give you some you know give you some coverage we'll give you a mention on our instagram feed in return and yeah well that's not going to pay your bills i'm completely against that culture but this is one instance where having a film made with your name on it just seems to me there is a benefit there and to getting that first one done then you can start but also you're right, I think, films they don't get on. made right that, that that's you know if you yes. look at you talk to an agent and and ask them the number of options that they've sold compared to the number of films that are actually made from those options the percentage would be very small um so you know for the author mm. who has bills to pay um you know I, I i i i understand the point in terms of publicity but that's that's an ip right that can be sold so you know and, and yeah it's very commercial yes yeah, um, well. they do get made they do get made and uh, there's that thing going around with the uh, queen's gambit producer saying that uh, which is a netflix mm. a fantastic netflix series an eight, 1980s novel but i mean that has been knocking around for years yeah uh, and you can see once you've watched the series everything makes sense and it's really brilliant but i'd be very interested in that original pitch meeting in a tv network or back in the 80s uh, uh, hatchet or whoever it was who who, who first published it when a guy says well i'm gonna write a book about it's a hatchet hashay hashay hash hash yes, sorry hash <laughs> um steak hashay well they're all going to be one soon aren't they to come up with a new name yeah um yeah just saying that that was going to be the content of the book but it got made because some visionary people mm. there you go i can't wait to see a dawson based on the novel by well you never know um, there's certainly some things happening you never know. Good. Okay. I should uh, should have said right at the beginning that you can learn more about uh, ads for authors by going to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors. Uh, everything you need to know will be on that page for you to make a, a good decision about that. And uh, you can drop us an email, of course, or there's a chat box on that page. You can chat sometimes to me and Mark, and uh, sometimes to Catherine and John and others and get some answers to your questions. 
Good. I think that is it, Mark. It's dark here, which is why mm. I'm eerily lit in blue. Same it's, here. Uh, mm. But uh, the days are getting longer. I know. Thank God. And thank Britain goodness. has just passed 2.4 million vaccine jabs, which is something to think, think about. Yeah, my dad's got his on Thursday. So. Has he? Oh, that's great. My dad is 90 next month and still hasn't got his, but we're in a yeah. very low infection area, so I don't know if they're shipping them off and to... your dad's not in a care home, so... No, yeah, absolutely. They're prioritising people in care homes. Okay, right, enough of the pandemic. That's yeah. it, I think, for this week. Thank you very much indeed to Barbara Hinsky for being our fantastic interviewee, and uh, well done on writing a glorious book there, Guiding Emily. Thank you, Mark. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show. <laughs>